It's easy to forget, but the Indiana Pacers rang in 2014 as the NBA's best team. Frank Vogel coached the league's most efficient defense by a long shot. Paul George played a big part in that while also blossoming as an offensive superstar, building on the prior season's most improved player award. Old school skyscraping center Roy Hibbert formed a one-man wall in front of the rim, while breakout wildcard Lance Stevenson gave the Pacers a jolt of youth and reckless energy, George Hill provided a steady hand at point guard, and David West kept everyone grounded with veteran gruffness and reliability. After a near-perfect start to the regular season, there was reason to believe Indiana could finally break LeBron James and the Heat's hold on the Eastern Conference crown. It was President Larry Bird's job to make sure the roster at Coach Vogel's disposal was up for the challenge. If you stand too far back, what happened next looks simple and obvious. A team that fell to the heat in 2013 lost again in 2014. Then they lost players and regressed to middle of the pack. But that doesn't cover it. This wasn't a huge collapse, but the way Indiana messed with a great thing then unraveled was pretty gnarly. Back in 2013, this team, a three seed, faced LeBron in the top seeded Heat in the Eastern Conference Finals. Indiana stole home court advantage by winning game two in Miami, only to fall behind with a couple blowout losses, then go down in seven. So there was the bar to clear in 2014. Indiana kept their core intact and plowed through the first four months of their 13-14 regular season schedule. The Pacers closed January 2014, holding the best record in the East, with a healthy lead over the Heat. February 1st brought two new storylines, seemingly minor ones. One, Lance Stevenson was mad. All-star rosters had just been finalized. Paul George was obviously chosen as an Eastern Conference starter. Roy Hibbert got voted in by coaches. Frank Vogel led the Eastern squad since he coached the team with the best record in the conference. But no Lance. Lance Stevenson was having a career year and felt like he'd been snubbed. Later reports even suggested Stevenson felt like Hibbert didn't deserve to make it over him. Speaking of Hibbert, the Pacers made a move on February 1st. They signed Andrew Bynum, once a champion and all-star, now trying to get his career back on track, a traditional center like Hibbert. Bynum ended up barely registering on the court. He played two games as a pacer, one of them a ridiculous 6 of 18 shooting bonanza in the last game of his bizarre NBA career. So yeah, Andrew Bynum was barely a pacer. His career in Indiana is not remembered for the basketball playing. Nevertheless, Bynum's presence irked Hibbert. He felt the pressure of someone set up to take his spot, even though that didn't really happen. Hibbert's play took a noticeable dip around the time Bynum came on board. These splits in roughly the same minutes are stark. But Larry Bird wasn't done tinkering. Toward the end of February, he made another move that looked like a no-brainer in pure basketball terms. Danny Granger was a career-long pacer and one-time all-star, but injuries had limited his utility. Orlando Johnson was a competent second-year guard, but probably wasn't going to factor into a playoff rotation. So Bird traded Granger for Evan Turner, a young, healthy guard with some postseason experience. The Pacers released Johnson to make the full trade work. Again, this looked minor, but it was not. Keystones had been removed. Even from the sidelines, Granger was a beloved veteran leader, a friend to all. David West says he knew the season was over the moment he got the phone call saying Granger had been traded. He knew they couldn't get past the heat. He knew that in February, Granger hardly played. Johnson was a similar case. He was young and a bench warmer, but a teammate everybody loved, whose presence they missed. And then there's the new guy. Evan Turner's niche and style of play looked to Stevenson like Bynum was to Hibbert. Here was another unpredictable microwave bench guard. Now Lance felt like his role on the team was in jeopardy. Like Hibbert, a disturbed Stevenson played measurably worse in the last two months of the season. So there are two straightforward basketball transactions that seemed fine, but screwed up Indiana's internal stability. Bird had removed the wrong Jenga blocks. But it wasn't just that. In late February, GQ magazine promoted a photo spread from their March issue. 
This photo caught the most attention. The starters wearing cool clothes, doing their best blue steel expressions, displaying various types and depths of cleavage. There's nothing unusual about successful, attractive athletes doing a little modeling. And yet, as if stricken with a curse, the Pacers barely cracked 500 in the 27 games after the GQ photos hit the internet. This from a team that had wrecked everyone up to that point. The losing rankled the locker room enough that Hibbert went public with a lengthy rant, headlined by the accusation that some of his teammates were selfish. When Indiana briefly lost their hold on the Eastern one seed, both Hibbert and David West said good, they didn't deserve it. The GQ spread isn't even the most interesting photographic exhibit from this chapter of Pacers basketball. When sordid rumors emerged about George, Hibbert, and Hibbert's fiance, George posted this Instagram photo with this pleading caption to try to calm everyone down. See, we caught a fish. Would backstabbing sex traders have caught a fish? Doubt it. Underneath the basketball was all psychological, emotional stuff. Stuff with which even the greatest teams in history had to contend. Perhaps the Pacers were one of those champions who would overcome all the noise. Perhaps they just cut it out entirely in the postseason, starting with a series against the Hawks. Nah. Nope. Stevenson and his new, apparently threatening understudy, Turner, physically fought right before Indiana's first playoff game against the Hawks. Indiana lost that game one and barely avoided a historic series upset after Hibbert struggled to match up with f***ing Pero Antic. The Pacers gathered themselves somewhat in the second round against the Wizards, but in an Eastern final rematch against the Heat, they fell well short of the 2013 high water mark. This team was the high seed, healthy, experienced, and vengeful, lauded as the best defense in the NBA, but they squandered an early series edge. LeBron and Dwayne Wade ran amuck to undo a Pacers lead late in game two. Miami came back from a big deficit in game three, then won games four and six by double digits to end a much less dramatic series than that of the prior year. Indiana's performance in this matchup is best remembered for Lance annoying LeBron and blowing in his ear and stuff, not the basketball. Major disappointment for a rattled bunch of Pacers. But if Indiana could settle things internally, the contending window remained. It may have even widened in July 2014 when LeBron James announced he would return to the Cleveland Cavaliers. With Miami defanged and Cleveland perhaps needing some time to build around LeBron, Bird sought to keep the Pacers' core intact for a championship push. He made their biggest free agent, Stevenson, a substantial extension offer. Even with that, even with Turner leaving the picture, Lance chose to bail signing a less secure deal with the Charlotte Hornets. Still, with LeBron shaking up the East and with a decent enough wing replacement in CJ Miles, the Pacers hoped to restore some camaraderie and run it back, all the way to the finals this time. And then, only then, did the bottom truly fall out. Late on a Friday night in August, in the waning moments of a fun, relaxed Team USA exhibition scrimmage, Paul George went up to contest a shot and came down with a crunch. I am certainly not going to make you watch George suffer an open fracture of the tibia and fibula in his right leg. Suffice to say it was gross, it required surgery, and everyone understood instantly that George would not be playing basketball for a long time. With Stevenson gone and George reassembling his leg, the 2014-15 Pacers stunk. Vogel still managed to squeeze out a top 10 defense, and George Hill played a borderline all-star season, but with Paul George returning for just six games, Indiana finished 38-44, and 44, missing the playoffs entirely a year removed from a one seed. Looking ahead to a full season George return, Bird insisted the Pacers would play smaller and faster in 2015-16. What did that mean for the tallest, slowest Indiana player? Well, Bird came right out and said Hibbert had a bad 14-15 season. He and Vogel insisted Hibbert would have a smaller role if he came back. That he'd have to earn his minutes, which, even if reasonable, is a harsh public statement about an established player. Bird's bluntness wasn't out of character, but it irked David West, who named the Hibbert treatment as a reason he declined his contract option to take a huge pay cut with the Spurs. 
If Bird was trying to neg Hibbert out of taking his own option though, it didn't work. Hibbert picked up the final year of his contract. To move on from Hibbert and focus on new draft pick Miles Turner as their center of the future, they'd have to make a trade. And so they did. Out went a recent all-star in exchange for a second rounder. The team to which Paul George made his full health, full season return barely resembled the messy but competitive Pacers of 2014. He and George Hill were the last core players standing and even Hill looked different. There wasn't much new talent besides Turner. To carry out his fast-paced small ball vision, Bird re-signed backup guard Rodney Stuckey and made a couple underwhelming free agent additions. Trying to follow Bird's vision, Coach Vogel projected George up a position to power forward. George didn't sound thrilled. Bird did not care. Miles ended up playing a lot of those undersized power forward minutes. And as the season wore on and Turner looked good, Vogel regressed to a more typical, less small ball approach. Stylistic changes notwithstanding, the Pacers followed a middling 45 and 37 season with a first round loss to the Raptors. George played spectacular playoff basketball and everyone else kind of disappointed. Days after elimination, Bird fired Vogel, once again wrapping a personnel move in some pretty harsh public candor. Instead of bringing in some maven of fast-paced small ball, Bird kept the head coach higher in-house, promoting assistant coach Nate McMillan. This was a risky shakeup, since Vogel was the coach who'd helped shape George into a superstar, and that superstar was going to become a free agent in just two years. If Bird was worried about further alienating his star, he didn't act like it. In a straightforward three-team swap, Bird ditched Hill to bring in a roughly equivalent point guard, Jeff Teague. A pretty lateral move, but one with a clear effect on relationships in the locker room. Hill was Paul George's best friend on the team. Just look at George's farewell Instagram post. In pure basketball terms, Bird's other 2016 moves didn't exactly match the stated plan to play fast. And none of it really worked. Indiana's offense improved a bit under McMillan, but their post-Vogel defense declined a lot. George's name came up in trade rumors. He wasn't having fun. He sounded like he missed his former teammates. And he declined a contract extension, unsure the Pacers were a winning team. Reacquiring Lance Stevenson restored a little bit of fun, but the Pacers barely broke 500. As if to measure how far Indiana had fallen, the Pacers faced LeBron and the Cavaliers in the first round of the playoffs and got swept with ease. The 2017 offseason's main drama was clear. A year from free agency, George insisted he was a Pacer. Indiana was his team, but that expiring contract still loomed. And Bird wasn't going to be the one to figure it out. After the 2017 playoff defeat, he stepped aside, promoting GM Kevin Pritchard into the president role. Pritchard got right down to business. In a shocking move, the Pacers dumped George and any uncertainty about his future, bringing back some players that honestly worked out pretty well for them. And indeed, this collapse isn't the story of a contender descending into absolute misery. The Pacers avoided the basement even while losing their best player. But don't forget how excellent this team was, how poised they seemed to take over the East if not win a title. Instead, these Pacers never won another playoff series and the core totally dissolved within three years. George's broken leg was a big reason why, but far from the only one. This collapse shows how much chemistry matters how marginal contributors might still be crucial presences, how even a minor newcomer might rock the boat, and how private relationships interact with public statements. Even the solidest, winningest on-court machine might be more delicate than it appears. The Pacers tinkered the wrong way with the wrong parts, and in doing so, busted a dynamo beyond repair. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to go back a little further in Pacers history, I recommend this episode of Rewinder. It's not a happy one. Or if you'd rather just see some more collapse, check these out.